This is Space Time, Series 22, Episode 75. Coming up on Space Time. New discoveries show galaxies sit in serene halos of gas. The origins of the interstellar comet 2i Borisov. And the 2019 Nobel Prizes awarded in Sweden. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers studying the origins of a mysterious cosmic blast known as a fast radio burst have unexpectedly uncovered important clues about the properties of the vast halos of gas surrounding galaxies. These massive halos, which extend 10 times further out than the stars in the galaxy, contain a significant proportion of the galaxy's matter. The findings reported in the journal Science suggest that these halos are actually composed of a serene ocean of gas, which is far less turbulent, less dense and less magnetised than expected. Understanding galaxy halos, which act like a fossil record, will help scientists better understand why material is being ejected from galaxies, causing them to stop growing. Fast radio bursts are sudden flashes originating at cosmic distances and releasing as much energy as half a billion suns, but in just nanoseconds. Their cause remains a mystery. A team of astronomers studying one of these fast radio bursts, which originated some 5 billion light years away, noticed some strange signatures in their data and realised that the signal from their fast radio burst had passed through the galactic halo of an intervening galaxy about 4 billion light years from Earth. One of the study's authors, Associate Professor Jean-Pierre McCarr from the Curtin University node of the International Centre for Radio Astronomy Research, says these galactic halos have traditionally been hard to study. That's because they're difficult to isolate with a telescope. The research was focusing on a fast radio burst detected last November by ASCAP, the Australian Square Kilometre Array Pathfinder Radio Telescope in outback Western Australia. McCarr and colleagues made the discovery as the fast radio burst shot through the intervening galaxy's halo of gas like a lighthouse beam cutting through fog. The authors expected the signal to be distorted by the galaxy. McCarr says it's a bit like going outside on a hot summer's day and seeing the air shimmering and the trees in the background looking distorted because of the temperature and density fluctuations in the air. He says that's what the team thought would happen with the signal from the fast radio burst becoming completely distorted after passing through the hot interstellar atmosphere of the galaxy. But instead of the stormy galactic weather they were expecting to see, the pulse had travelled through a calm sea of unperturbed gas. Carr says the findings suggest galaxy halos are much more serene than previously thought, with gas that's less turbulent, less dense and far less magnetised than expected trying to do was localise fast radio bursts to their host galaxies and so this was with the Australian SKA Pathfinder which is proving quite adept at this business of detecting fast radio bursts and we detected this thing to a uh, particular host galaxy and lo and behold serendipity came into play. There was a galaxy I- intervening along that line of sight so this galaxy that we localised the, the fast radio burst to was about 5 billion light years away but but there was this intervening galaxy about 4 billion light years away. So it was pure serendipity. There was a, um, a fast radio burst and it went straight through the halo of an intervening galaxy. And that only happens about one in a hundred times. And we just got lucky. And we seized the opportunity and said, right, now we can go to town on the physics of what's going on inside the, the halos of massive galaxies. So that's how it came about. And what does this tell us about the halos of big galaxies? This is obviously where we think there's a awful a lot of dark matter sitting. Well, we think there's dark matter. We think there's a lot of normal matter, what uh, astronomers like to call baryonic matter, the stuff that you and I are made of, the stuff that forms the stars in those galaxies. It should all be lurking about in the halos of these galaxies. So you look at a typical galaxy and the stuff that fuels that star formation and the stuff that the star formation flings out into the furthest reaches of those galaxies, it actually extends out 10 times further than the disk of the star starlight that you see. So it, there's a lot of stuff that's in this halo of this galaxy. It's the fuel that's going to eventually 
fall down and form the next generation of stars, but it's mixed with hot gas and all sorts of other gas that's actually been expelled from current star formation. So it's really the, uh, if you like, if, if you're a farmer, it's the rain that's going to fall down on your galaxy to, to make all your plants grow in the, uh, in the stellar disk. If you extrapolate what you've just said, then that means that the halo of the Milky Way would probably encompass the large and small Magellanic clouds. Oh, it most certainly does. It goes, wow. We believe it goes much further out than that. So we believe it extends out to perhaps 300,000 light years from the centre of the galaxy. These halos are really big things and they contain an awful lot of mass. We think they contain as much mass as the stars in the galaxy itself. What were you able to find out about the source of the uh, fast radio burst? Were you able to narrow it to a particular part of the galaxy? We were able to identify which galaxy it was and this was a galaxy at a redshift of 0.4755 which to you and me means it's about um, five, it's about billion. five um, billion light years away. At the time the telescope, this ASCAP, uh, this Australian SKA Pathfinder was only operating with 12 of its antennas so only a third of its capacity instead of its uh, 36 antennas it was running in a particular mode where we only had 12 antennas so we weren't be able to get quite as good a position for this fast radio burst so we we're only able to say which galaxy it came from but not with much certainty as to where it came in the galaxy. That was a bit different from the uh, the first fast radio burst that ASCAP localised where we were able to say for a particular galaxy, aha, it went off about five kiloparsecs or 15,000 light years from the centre of that galaxy. It was right on, it was on the outskirts of that particular galaxy. We weren't able to make any sort of a, a, a statement here. What we were able to say was though that with that position that it went through the halo of that intervening system at a distance of about 28 kiloparsecs. So uh, about 60,000 light years from the centre of that intervening galaxy. What are the properties of the intervening galaxy or its halo that you're able to work out from looking at them via the fast radio burst? Well, well, that was the real surprise because people think that there's all of this matter that's sitting there. So there's a, there's supposed to be a hot halo of matter of temperature of about a million degrees Celsius that's sitting there and embedded in it are all these cold clouds that are possibly going to rain down on that galaxy and fuel star formation and things like that. But the fast radio burst went through that galaxy halo as if there was nothing there. So it, it, what we're able to deduce was that the density of this cold matter in this galaxy, or if you like, you can think of it as a, a mist of cold clouds embedded mm. in this hot medium, that either the mist is much more sparse than we thought, or the density of these clouds is much smaller than we thought, or a bit of both. The thing is, it's the, the fast radio radio burst is kind of like a submarine sonar ping. You've got this incredibly short burst, in this case of order 100 microseconds and it, it goes through this galaxy and, and if there's a lot of material in there, it'll get dispersed by that. The polarisation properties of the burst will be changed in a wavelength dependent manner that we can measure and we might even get what's called multi-path propagation where the fast radio burst can actually take multiple paths through that medium and arrive at our telescope and we didn't see any of that. So the big surprise was that the medium is a lot less dense than we thought and by that I mean that there have been optical diagnostics of these galaxies. People have done optical spectroscopy on uh, galaxies of this sort and tried to infer properties of these galaxies' halos. The thing about the fast radio burst is, is it's an entirely different diagnostic and it's a very precise one and it revealed a completely different picture. The, the ionized hydrogen is very, very difficult to see. Yeah. So there should be quite a lot of ionised hydrogen but spectroscopically, optical telescopes, that's very, very hard to see. Now in fact when the hydrogen is ionised it, it forms what we call a plasma and the fast radio burst, the great thing about these things is that the radiation gets dispersed and it can account for every single ionised hydrogen atom, every proton and electron along that line of sight. The fast radio burst sees it. It's this process of 
of dispersion. If you shine sunlight through a prism, you break up the white light into the colours of the spectrum, and that's because the refractive index of the glass and the prism is different for all of those different colours. And it's exactly the same when this fast radio burst goes through this halo of this uh, galaxy or any ionised matter. It sees a different refractive index. The light travels at a different speed for each different wavelength. And so when we detect this fast radio burst, although the pulse only lasts about 100 microseconds, because we're observing at a range of different wavelengths, we see the pulse come in at different times. And by measuring those different times with different wavelengths, we can deduce exactly how much stuff it's gone through. Then the scattering comes into play, so there are all sorts of other propagation effects that we can also see. So we look at the polarisation and how that changes with wavelength, and we can say, oh, what was the magnetic field in that region? And we can look at the pulse shape even. And if the pulse shape is changing with wavelength in a particular manner, that's due to turbulence in that medium, and that turbulence is far more likely to be due to the colder, denser matter than it is the warmer, more sparse matter. And that's how you make deductions about how much cold matter there is, or you can put limits on it. So there's all sorts of interesting things at play just from this one pulse that's gone through this halo. That's Associate Professor Jean-Pierre McCarr from the Curtin University node of the International Centre for Radio Astronomy Research. And this is Space Time. If you'd like to help support Space Time and the great work we do promoting science, then why not come and join our Patreon family? For just a few dollars a month, you'll get access to a slick commercial-free double-episode version of Space Time every week, as well as extended interviews not included in the show, and an invitation to join our special Patreon-only Facebook group where you can come and chat, discuss the show, ask questions, whatever you want with like-minded listeners and our team. You can get all the details at patreon.com slash spacetime with Stuart Gary, where you can see the various reward levels we have and what works for you. And of course, most importantly, you'll be helping to support our show and the work we do to deliver the wonders of the universe to everyone. Now that URL again is patreon, spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N, patreon.com slash spacetime with Stuart Gary. And of course, you can find the details in the show notes or just click the orange button on our website. And thanks to all our patrons, because it's your generosity and support that helps keep our show going. This is Space Time with Stuart Gary. Now, while we're on the subject of galactic halos, a new study has discovered that our own galaxy, the Milky Way's galactic halo, is constantly exchanging matter with the neighbouring intergalactic medium. It's long been known that supernovae and violent stellar winds blow gas out of the galactic disk, and that gas then falls back onto the galaxy, forming new generations of stars. But a report in the Astrophysical Journal has concluded that this recycling process is somehow producing a surplus of incoming gas. The study's lead author, Andrew Fox, from the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, Maryland, says astronomers expected to find the Milky Way's books balanced with an equilibrium between gas inflow and outflow. But 10 years of Hubble ultraviolet data has shown there's far more material coming in than going out. Fox says the source of this excess inflowing material remains a mystery for now. One possible explanation is that this new gas could be coming from the intergalactic medium. But Fox suspects that the Milky Way is also siphoning gas away from small nearby satellite galaxies. The new study provides the best measurements yet for just how fast gas flows into and out of the Milky Way. However, the full extent of this gas transfer still remains a mystery. That's because the study could only look at cool gas transfer and couldn't include hotter gas movements. Prior to this study, astronomers knew that the galactic gas reserves were being replenished by inflow and depleted by outflow, but they didn't know the relative amounts of gas coming in compared to going out. The balance between these two processes is important because it regulates the formation of new generations of stars and planets. The survey looked at 10 years of archival data from the Hubble Space Telescope's Cosmic Origin Spectrograph, analysing some 200 past ultraviolet gas flow observations of the diffuse halo that surrounds the disk of our galaxy. Now, this spectrograph was actually designed to study the universe far beyond our galaxy. But when the authors examined its data, they found they were also able to study the foreground gas in the Milky Way. Because the galaxy's gas clouds are invisible, Fox's team used light from background quasars to detect these clouds and their motions. 
Quasars are the cores of galaxies with actively feeding supermassive black holes, shining like powerful beacons visible across billions of light years. And when the quasar's light reaches the Milky Way, it passes through the halo clouds. The gas in the clouds then absorbs specific frequencies of light, leaving telltale fingerprints in the quasar light. Fox singled out the fingerprint for silicon and used it to trace the gas around the Milky Way. Outflowing and inflowing gas clouds were distinguished by the Doppler shift of the light passing through them. Approaching clouds are bluer because the wavelengths are being compressed, while receding clouds are redder as the wavelengths are being stretched. Currently, the Milky Way is the only galaxy providing enough data to provide a full accounting of gas inflow and outflow. But Fox says there are now enough Hubble observations to begin a similar study of the M31 galaxy in Andromeda, the closest large galaxy to the Milky Way. This is Space Time. Still to come, we look at the Nobel Prizes in Physics, Chemistry and Medicine, and in the Science Report, discovery of a 7,000-year-old religious temple in the Middle East. All that and more, still to come. A new study claims the recently discovered interstellar comet 2i Borisov probably came from a nearby binary star system called Kruger 60. Located some 13.15 light-years away in the constellation Cephas, Kruger 60 is composed of two spectral-type M red dwarf stars, which orbit each other every 44.6 Earth years. Named after the German astronomer Adalbert Kruger, who discovered it in 1873, Kruger 60 is the 10th nearest multiple star system to the Sun, and it's getting closer every year. Kruger 60a has about 27% of the Sun's mass and about 35% of the solar radius, while its binary partner Kruger 60b is a somewhat smaller star, with about 18% of the Sun's mass and 24% of its radius. The new study by the Polish Academy of Sciences modelled the motion of Comet 2i Borisov, as well as the Sun and 647 other stellar systems from their list of potential gravitational perturbers of cometary motion. They found that about a million years ago, 2i Borisov would have been in the neighbourhood of Kruger 60, at a distance of about 5.7 light years and having an extremely small relative velocity of just 3.43 kilometres per second. And that suggests it may well have originated from the system. Borisov entered our solar system from the direction of Cassiopeia, near its border with Perseus. The direction indicates that it originated from the galactic plane rather than the galactic halo. As seen from Earth, Borisov will be in our northern skies until around mid-November. It then crosses the ecliptic plane on November the 13th, entering the southern hemisphere skies. Borisov's extremely hyperbolic orbit will reach perihelion, its closest approach to the Sun, on December the 8th, near the main asteroid belt. It'll make its closest approach to us in late December, passing some 300 million kilometres from Earth. It'll then leave our solar system in the direction of telescopium. Unlike our first known interstellar visitor, Mau Mau, which had an asteroidal appearance, Borisev's observations suggest the presence of a coma around the body, indicating a cloud of dust and gas, which is why it's being classified as a comet. Borisev's estimated to be somewhere between 1.4 and 6.6 kilometres in diameter although that will probably be firmed up as it gets closer to us. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. The 2019 Nobel Prize for Physics has been awarded to James Peebles, Michael Mayer and Didier Kulos. Peebles was awarded the prize for his theoretical research, which forms the foundations of science's understanding of the origins of the universe. You see, he predicted the existence of the cosmic microwave background radiation, the now faint afterglow of the Big Bang at a temperature of just 2.7 degrees above absolute zero. This ancient radiation which bathes the entire universe was created just 380,000 years after the birth of the cosmos, some 13.82 billion years ago. So that's when the universe had cooled down enough for protons and electrons to combine for the first time, creating the first atoms and that allowed photons to then travel through space for the first time unencumbered. Peebles was able to interpret these traces from the infancy of the universe and discover new physical processes. The results have shown us a universe in which just 5% of its total content is known, the matter which constitutes the stars, planets, trees, houses, cars, dogs, cats and people. The rest, some 95%, remains unknown dark matter and dark energy, dark because they remain a mystery to science today. Peebles' work has helped science better understand the universe. 
Mayer and Culotz were awarded their Nobel Prize for their discovery of the first exoplanet, Pegasi 51b, orbiting a sun-like star. They were able to detect the ever-so-slight wobbles in the star's position caused by the gravitational pull of the Jupiter-sized planet orbiting that star. It's another use of the Doppler method we discussed earlier in the show. Since their historic discovery, more than 4,000 confirmed exoplanets have now been discovered orbiting stars other than the Sun. The nearest orbiting Proxima Centauri, the nearest star of the Sun, just 4.23 light-years away. The work of Mayer and Kulos has paved the way for future discoveries, which might one day eventually include planets harboring life. Meanwhile, the Nobel Prize for Chemistry has been awarded to John Goodenough, Stanley Whittingham and Akira Yoshino for their work in the development of the lithium-ion battery. Lithium-ion batteries power many of the world's portable electronic devices. When lithium-ion batteries charge, the lithium ions and electrons move from the positive electrode to the negative electrode. And when the battery is discharging, the opposite happens, and the flow of electrons powers the device. Whittingham created the first functional lithium battery in the 1970s using a titanium disulfide cathode and a lithium metal anode. But the problem is the lithium metal anode made it explosive and unsafe. Then in the 1980s, Goodenough replaced the metal sulfide with a cobalt oxide cathode, doubling the voltage, but still retaining that lithium metal anode. Finally, Yoshino replaced the lithium metal anode with a carbon-based petroleum coke, leading to the world's first commercial lithium-ion batteries in 1991. And the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine has been awarded to William Kalin, Peter Ratcliffe and Greg Semenza for their research into how living cells sense and adapt to oxygen availability. Oxygen sensing is important for cell metabolism, allowing the production of red blood cells and new blood vessels. It's also important for the immune system and plays a key role in diseases such as anemia and cancer. The research will help scientists better understand how oxygen levels affect cell reactions. And drugs that can activate or block oxygen sensing mechanisms could be useful in treating cancer or other illnesses. And they're the major science awards in the 2019 Nobel Prizes. A Russian Soyuz capsule has returned safely to Earth, landing on the windswept Kazakhstan steppe following a 203-day mission to the International Space Station. Confirm SKD main engine activation. And the deorbit burn is underway. Delta V 19.2. And the deorbit burn is complete and nominal. A perfect uh, deorbit burn. Nick Haig and Alexei Ovchinin heading home completing an odyssey that began almost a year ago with a launch abort from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan, culminating with a 203-day mission on board the orbital outpost at the International Space Station, Hazar Ali al-Mansuri completing a pathfinding mission for the United Arab Emirates. Touchdown in Kazakhstan on a desolate step to the southeast of the town of Jezkazgan, now 48 minutes from now. The crew heading home, soon to drop out of orbit uh, for its high-speed entry back into the Earth's atmosphere, the upper portion of the uh, vehicle, the orbital module, that's the bulbous section at the very top of the Soyuz, has uh, been depressurized, setting the stage for the uh, pyrotechnic separation of the three sections of the Soyuz coming up at 5.34 a.m. Central Time. At uh, the landing site, uh, preparations are underway for the arrival of the Soyuz MS-12 and the three crew members. There are a dozen uh, Russian Mi-8 helicopters, part of the Rosaviatsa Search and Recovery Forces with NASA personnel on board that are airborne, having taken off uh, several minutes ago from the airfield in Jezkazgan for the landing site some uh, 92 miles to the southeast of Jezkazgan. Uh, an Antonov uh, fixed-wing aircraft uh, will be serving as a flying uh, command and control vehicle, basically a command and control relay center that will enable uh, voice and telemetry from the Soyuz to be relayed to the Russian flight control team in the uh, Russian flight control room in Korolyov. This is Mission Control Houston. Just to recap, uh, the Soyuz MS-12 uh, is in the process of uh, departing from its orbit, having uh, completed a 4-minute, 42-second uh, deorbit burn, a retrograde firing of its main engine to uh, slow its velocity.
gravity down to the point uh, where the tug of Earth's gravity will pull it back into the Earth's atmosphere. Touchdown is expected just under 40 minutes from now at a landing site to the southeast of Jezkazgan on a remote uh, steppe, a desolate area of Kazakhstan where Soyuz vehicles uh, will typically land these days. Expedition 61 uh, underway aboard the International Space Station under the command of European Space Agency astronaut Luca Parmitano, joined by uh, Russian cosmonauts Alexander Skvortsov and Alex Gropochka and NASA astronauts Drew Morgan, Jessica Mir, and Christina Cook. This is about uh, the point uh, where the Soyuz uh, is too far away from the International Space Station for the geometry of antennas on the vehicles to uh, maintain VHF voice communications. Uh, this is uh, totally expected and is common for a uh, Soyuz descent where communications may be lost altogether or at the very best uh, would become choppy until it approaches the landing site and reestablishes communications through the Antonov uh, command and control flying uh, aircraft. The next major event is the pyrotechnic separation of the three sections of the Soyuz scheduled at 5.34 a.m. Central Time. That will be followed just four minutes later by the vehicle entering into the plasma regime in which temperatures around the Soyuz will build to about 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit. It's heat shield ablating uh, and repelling uh, that buildup of plasma around the vehicle. Uh, once uh, the vehicle exits the plasma regime at about uh, 5.43 a.m. Central Time, we uh, at that point uh, will be about two minutes away from the command uh, to open up parachutes. The Russian search and recovery forces are fanned out across the area. Russian MI-8 helicopters are airborne headed for the landing site. Uh, Russian uh, personnel, some of which are already uh, in the vicinity of the landing site, poised uh, for the arrival of the Soyuz vehicle under its main parachute and the touchdown uh, and uh, the end of this mission for Alexei Ovchinin, Nick Haig, and Haza Ali Al-Mansuri. And there's our first view of uh, the Soyuz MS-12 under its main parachute. The venting uh, valves have been opened to vent uh, hydrogen peroxide fuel for the entry control thrusters and oxygen in the life support system tank. This is a combination of hydrogen peroxide and oxygen escaping into the atmosphere to safe the Soyuz spacecraft for landing so that no hazardous gases remain in the vehicle's tanks when the soft landing engines fire a few seconds before touchdown. This is an, a normal occurrence at an altitude of some 18,000 feet. Touchdown right on the money at 5.59 a.m. Central Time, 6.59 a.m. Eastern Time, 4.59 p.m. at the landing site. The soft landing engines having fired. The main parachute now reefing. Nick Haig, Alexei Ovchinin, and Haza Ali Al-Mansuri are home. The Soyuz MS-12 capsule included two members of the Expedition 60 crew who undertook hundreds of experiments covering biology, biotechnology, physics, and earth sciences, studying devices designed to mimic human organs and measuring the distribution of carbon dioxide in Earth's atmosphere. A free-flying Russian robot set up in late August during the unmanned verification flight of the Soyuz MS-14 capsule was also tested during the mission to see how it performed on station. The MS-14 was flown to test the Soyuz avionics compatibility with a new Soyuz 2 launch vehicle, which is slated to start transporting crew to the space station in March. As part of the test flight, the capsule was loaded with supplies and equipment for the Expedition 60 crew, including the Russian Skybot F-850 anthropomorphic humanoid robot Fedor. The robot, which looks a lot more like Chappie than CP-3O, only spent two weeks on station before returning to Earth on the Soyuz MS-14's return run, landing on the Kazakhstan steppe. Russia has launched the new gravitational Geodesy satellite into orbit. The GOIK-2 spacecraft was placed into a 1,000-kilometre-high orbit by a ROCOT rocket launched from the Plesetsk Cosmodrome 800 kilometres north of Moscow. The ROCOT is a converted SS-19 Stiletto intercontinental ballistic missile, with its usual thermonuclear payload replaced with a scientific satellite. The Russian Ministry for Defence operates pairs of Geodesy satellites to maintain up-to-date records of changes in Earth's gravitational field, density changes deeper inside the planet, ocean tide movements, ice conditions, and even the Earth's rotational velocity. Accurately knowing a planet's gravitational field along a given flight path helps increase the accuracy of Russian ballistic missiles. And Moscow has been launching these Geodesy satellites since the days of the Soviet Union. The current GOIK-2 series is the third generation of these spacecraft, following on from the earlier Geode Sephra and Geode IK or Muson series. The 1400kg GOIK-2 or Muson-2 was designed to operate as a pair of spacecraft, but a third one was commissioned after the first of the satellites failed in orbit. 
China has launched two new Badao-3 navigation satellites into orbit. The spacecraft were flown aboard a Long March 3B rocket from the Zhaichang Satellite Launch Center in Sichuan Province in southwestern China. They're the 47th and 48th satellites in the Badu constellation and the 19th and 20th respectively to be placed in medium Earth orbit. Beijing hopes to have its new global satellite navigation system completed next year. The new spacecraft are equipped with updated processors and new lightweight hydrogen maser clocks designed to provide a more stable precision frequency reference, improving accuracy. They're also equipped with additional payloads to assist in search and rescue operations and with telecommunication services. The launch also represented the 312th mission for the Long March series of carrier rockets. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with the Science Report. Extremely hot and dry summers in Australia could be down to more than just El Nino. Scientists have found that an Antarctic jet stream known as the Antarctic Polar Vortex is driving these conditions across eastern Australia from spring to early summer. A report in the journal Nature Geoscience claims that when this polar vortex is weakening, spring and summer temperatures are up to 2 degrees Celsius higher in Queensland, New South Wales and northeastern South Australia, and rainfall was reduced. Australia is currently in the grips of an extreme polar vortex breakdown, which is driving record drought conditions and a hot, dry outlook for the summer. Scientists say because this vortex changes over long timescales, it may be possible to predict early summertime hot and dry extremes and wildfire risks across eastern Australia a season in advance. It's been reported that a man who worked outside while wearing a high-visibility safety vest complete with safety reflective striping has suffered first-degree burns when the reflective tape overheated. A report in the Medical Journal of Australia claims the 40-year-old man went to his local hospital emergency department complaining of a painful red rash across his back, which he noticed when he undressed at home after work. The red mark coincided with the upper high-visibility band on his work shirt. The authors say, to the best of their knowledge, this is the first reported case of skin burns occurring from overheating retroreflective tape. Suicidal thoughts and behaviours among LGBTIQ youth are influenced by a complex range of factors, according to an international meta-analysis which investigated no less than 44 studies over the past 20 years. A report in the journal Archives of Suicide Research found P-victimization, discrimination and stigma, sexual victimization, intimate partner violence and depression were just some of the varied factors affecting LGBTIQ youth. The analysis also identified limitations in current studies, including the age range of youths, the kinds of thoughts and behaviours identified, publication bias, and limited analysis for transgender youths. Archaeologists have discovered a 5,000-year-old city and a 7,000-year-old temple in northern Israel. The Israel Antiquities Authority say the early Bronze Age city, which was found at Wadi Ara near Haifa, covered an area of more than 160 acres and probably had around 6,000 residents. During excavations under the Bronze Age city's houses, archaeologists found a religious temple that was some 2,000 years older. It contained evidence from various religious rituals, including a large stone basin used to hold liquids, burnt animal bones suggesting sacrificial offerings, and rare figurines. Millions of pottery fragments, flint tools and basalt stone vessels were also uncovered at the dig site. The discoveries indicated that two springs originating from the area attracted people to the site, where researchers believe people made their living from agriculture and trade with other towns. Well, a bit of bad news now. You may remember reports last year that flavanols in dark chocolate can improve your vision. The problem is a new study suggests they really don't make any difference at all. German scientists split 22 participants into two groups and gave them either dark chocolate or milk chocolate. Two hours later, they were subjected to a battery of visual tests, and the researchers found no difference between the two groups. You can read the findings in detail in the Journal of the American Medical Association. And that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audioboom, from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favourite podcast download provider. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog, where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web that I find interesting or amusing. 
Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word in lower case, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary, and you can also find us on the Spacetime with Stuart Gary YouTube channel. Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 